Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. All right, so I know you're in your homes, but turn, turn to the person next to you, whether it's your family member, brother, sister, spouse, whoever, if a question, we have a question you're going to ask them. Would you turn to them and say, what is Axios? What is Axios? And now you're going to answer. You're going to answer them yourself. So say to them again, God is Axios. God is Axios. That's our word this morning, and we're going to figure out what that means. If you can turn to Revelations chapter 4, verse 11, and as you're turning your Bibles or you're scrolling on your digital Bibles, I know you're probably thinking, how is he starting the beginning of the year with the end of the book? And it's going to make sense. I promise that we're going to, that's going to make sense. And the, the beginning of the year is supposed to be, you know, the New Year's resolutions and things about, a message about goals. But our message this morning is going to be about how, what God is going to do through you and for you in this upcoming year. So Revelations 4 verse 11 says this, Worthy are you our Lord and God to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and because of you your will they existed and were created so that word that that word axios is the original greek for the word worthy so axios are you our lord and god worthy are you our lord and god we're focusing this morning on the word worthy so I had a spiritual mentor in my life growing up, and his name was Randy. And every year, at the beginning of the year, he would pick a new word. That would be his word of the year. And this word was supposed, this word helped him and encouraged him to stay focused on what God was calling him to do in his life. So the word would vary every year, and it would just keep him focused on the word of God. It would keep him focused on the mission. It would keep him focused on what there was to do that year. And I stopped doing that for a while, and then a few years ago, I decided to pick it back up. And, and so two years ago, I picked the word elevate. And that word for me was to help sharpen, train, and elevate the gifts that God has given me not for my own glory, but when I elevate the gifts God's given me, I get to elevate the name of Jesus higher. So I spent the year focusing on becoming better in the crafts that God had called me to do. And so my word was elevate. And then last year, the word was innovate. So that the focus of that was that I wouldn't keep doing the same things over and over again in ministry just because that's the way it's always been done. If there's something going on, if, if, there's, if there's a question on whether we should do something or not for the name of Jesus, and the answer is, well, that's just the way it's always been. That's the tradition. That's not always a good reason. So I want to make sure we are being creative and doing things that need to be done to take the name, take the gospel further. And would you know it, 2020 hit, and in March we really had, we were forced to innovate. We wanted to take our youth group and change it and make it more small group based. And because of not being able to gather in large crowds, we were forced to innovate and do that. We had been talking for over a year, wanting to do more online ministry and have a better YouTube presence as a youth ministry. And because 2020 didn't allow us to meet in person, we had to innovate and meet online and create and, and start creating that content and media. So innovate was the perfect word for 2020. And this year, I know, I know elevate and innovate might rhyme, but the word of the year for me this year doesn't follow that suit. It's, it's worthy or axios. And really, that, that's because the Holy Spirit kind of shook me up and wanted me to refocus on were the things that I was doing or the things that I am doing in my life really worthy of the Lord? Are they worthy of the gospel? Are the things that I'm doing, uh, do they have eternal value or am I wasting time and effort? And so what does that word worthy really mean? It means a few things. It means requiring recognition or deserving attention. When somebody does something so amazing or outstanding that you have to give it recognition, like if a football player is so amazing in that season that they have to give him 
rookie of the year, or league MVP. It means deserving of effort. If you want the title to be something, you have to train and put in the effort to get there. If you want to be a marathon runner, you have to put in the effort and train and eventually get to the point where you can run 26 and a half miles and earn the title of putting the effort to be a marathon runner. It means to be qualified for or suitable for. So if you want to be qualified for that job or that opening or that promotion, and because you have the experience now or you have the degree and you have the education, you are now qualified for that job title. And so I want to share a story with you guys about a time when I was worthy of, or I thought I was worthy of recognition. So in 2017, I was deployed and it was, I was in the Air Force for 12 years, eight, eight years, sorry. And I was deployed in 2017 overseas and it was about my second or third month on deployment and every month they would give out this award. They would give out these awards and one of them, the one I was focused on was Airman of the Month. And my friend and my coworker, he won Airman of the Month. And our, our job was we, put, we built the cargo and we put it on the planes for wherever it had to go. And it was his last month, it was actually his last week when he won the award. So I thought, next month, I'm gonna win that award. And I knew exactly what I had to do to win the award because he, he built, we, in our job, it's called capping a pallet when you build the pallet to put it on the plane. And so in that month, he capped 105 pallets. So I knew in the next month, I need to hit that mark. And so it's 100 and plus degrees outside every day. And we worked outside in the middle of the desert. And that month I was working and working. I had my goals set. And that month I capped 120 pallets because everything is tracked online. They knew who did what and how much you did. And I was confident I was worthy of that title, of that award. So when they came around that month to hand out the awards and they gathered us all together, when they said Airman of the Month goes to, in my head, I didn't actually do it, but in my head I was basically ready to like stand up and start walking to the front. Like I knew it was mine. I beat the guy last month, so there's no way I'm not getting it. And I don't know what name they called when they said Airman of the Month because I had, I don't know what happened, but they didn't call Pine. That's all I do now. And I was so upset. I was upset. I, was, I went back to my dorm room that night and I was pacing back and forth nonstop for a while, probably for like a half hour. I laid in my bed just staring at the ceiling in anger. And then in that moment, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And it's amazing when the Holy Spirit speaks, but sometimes, sometimes it hurts. And so this was one of those moments where it was good, but it hurt. And the Holy Spirit said a few things. The first thing he said was, you're seeking the recognition of man instead of the recognition of God. And I thought, that's true. Sorry, Lord. And I wish he had stopped there. But he wasn't done. And he said, you thought, you're hurt right now because you didn't get something that you thought you were worthy of, that you thought you deserved. But imagine how Jesus felt on the cross because he is worthy of the throne in heaven but he was given nails and the cross and a crown of thorns. And you thought you were worthy of an award. Imagine how Jesus felt. So imagine how Jesus felt up on the cross when he's worthy of the people's praise, but instead they said, crucify him. And Jesus' response was, Father, forgive them. See, our focus today is worthy and living a life worthy. And this message, the Holy Spirit convicted and spoke to me on it before I'm bringing it to you. But I want you to reflect on your life in the last week, in the last month, over the last year. And think about, does your life reflect that God is worthy or does your life reflect that you are worthy? Jesus was worthy, Jesus is worthy of our praise. But often he only gets it once a week on Sunday morning. He's worthy of our time, but we're so busy streaming episode after episode. And then by the time we know it, we have a whole season gone in a couple of days. And that one convicted me too, I promise. 
we're so busy working, going to school, studying, doing extracurricular activities, taking the kids here, there, everywhere that they need to be. And at the end of the day, we lay our heads on our pillow and we think, God knows our heart when he can't get, he's worthy and he can't get 10 minutes of our day to read our word, read the word he's given us or pray. He's worthy of our finances. He's blessed us with a job. He's blessed us with a job that gives us a paycheck. The skills that he's given us, the education he's allowed us to obtain. And the commandment is to give 10%. And when it comes time to tithe, we're too busy typing Amazon.com and ordering the newest thing, whatever our heart desires. Trust me, that one convicted me too because I have Amazon boxes in my garage as well. Does your life reflect that he is worthy or you are worthy? If you can open up to Philippians 1, verse 27, we're going to read out of there this morning. Philippians 1, 27 says this, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. See, we're going to talk about how to live a life worthy of the gospel this morning. How to live a life worthy of the gospel. The first way we live a life worthy of the gospel is we have to know the gospel. We have to know the gospel. We have to read it. We have to read it. We have to hide it in our hearts. We have to be able to know it. We have to know it good enough to share it. We have to know that All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have to know that the wages of that sin is death. We have to know that God so loved the world that he sent his only son. We have to know that Jesus is our way out of eternal hell and into eternal life. We have to know the gospels. We have to know his word, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the story of Jesus. We have to know it in order to share it and bring hope to others. The second way that we can live a life worthy of the gospel, we're going to read on. Because a lot of times when I read scripture, this is just what happens in my head when I read it. I I see a command when, like Paul says, live a life worthy of the gospel. And in my head, I just think, well, how? And so he tells us to live a life worthy of the gospel. And then he tells us exactly how. Without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you, this is the sign of them that will, that will be destroyed, but that you will be saved. And that on the behalf, that you will be saved by God, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. We're going to go back to verse, back to verse 27, so you can hear that again. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, then whether it come to see you, or only to hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit. So how do we live a life worthy of the gospel? We have to stand firm in one spirit as a church. Stand firm in one spirit, not to be different, not to look different, not to be hypocrites of what the word of God says, but to stand firm. What does it say? Stand firm in one spirit on the word of God. Stand firm in the spirit on the gospel. We live a life worthy of the gospel by standing firm in the spirit. And what happens when you stand firm in the spirit? That's what it is. The life worthy of the gospel looks like you standing firm in the spirit. And what happens when you do that? Well, it said that you'll, cre- you'll encounter opposition is what it said in verse 28. You will encounter opposition when you stand firm in the gospel. See, This isn't a message about you creating your New Year's resolutions. This is a message hopefully inspiring you to have a new year of revolution in your life. Because when you have a revolution, you stand firm against an opponent, against an enemy. See, when our founding fathers founded the country, they they started the revolutionary war. And they, they did that under a principle that all people deserved representation and that democracy was the way to create a government. And they had opposition against other countries and against, their, against the enemy. When you have a revolution, when you stand firm in the, in the gospel, 
When you stand firm in the spirit on the word of God, you will encounter opposition. Jesus himself said it in John 15, 18. The world hates you. Remember, it hated me first. When you stand firm in the gospel, you will encounter opposition. And it goes further and it says, it calls us to suffer for Christ. That's the reality. We will encounter suffering and persecution in this, on this earth, in this world, in this life. We will encounter persecution. When you stand firm in the spirit, you'll encounter opposition and you may suffer some persecution. But take, hold, take heart, brothers and sisters, because the one who is within you is greater than the one who is in, in the world. That's the promise he's given us. Jesus has already overcome. While we, there may be some suffering and persecution here, eternal life has already been decided. Jesus has already won. We're going to move on to the next scripture, which is Colossians 1, 10. 1, 9, 9 and 10. It says this, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in, in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and that you may please him in every way. So how do we live a life worthy of the Lord? How do we live a life worthy of the gospel that pleases him? It says it right there. If we go back to verse 9, it says it. For this reason, since this day we have heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge. Asking God to fill you with the knowledge and understanding that the Spirit gives. So to live a life worthy of the Lord, the key is to live a Spirit-filled and Spirit-led life. When the Spirit fills you, you get the things that the Spirit gives for a reason and a calling and an understanding. So when we live a spirit-filled and spirit-led life, it'll lead us to living a life worthy of the Lord and worthy of the gospel. So what does it say happens when we live, when the spirit fills us, when we live a spirit-led life? What does that look like? It says this, live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work. So bearing fruit in every good work, what are, what are the fruits? Scripture goes on in Galatians to tell us exactly what those fruits are. You'll, you'll have more love, you'll have more joy, more peace, more forbearance, more kindness in your life, more goodness, more faithfulness, more gentleness, and, and probably what, one thing a lot of us need is more self-control. That's what your life will look like when, you have a, when you're living a spirit-filled, spirit-led life. What else happens when the spirit fills us? You'll grow in knowledge of God. Being strengthened in all power by the Holy Spirit. So this is what happens. You grow in knowledge. When the spirit fills you and spirit leads you, he leads you right back to the word of God. You'll grow in the knowledge of God of God. The Spirit, Holy Spirit will not take you away from what the Word of God says. He'll never lead you astray from the Word of God. If you want to test or figure out, am I hearing from the Holy Spirit? This is why we said we have to know the Word of God, because when you hear the Holy Spirit and it confirms what you already know in the Word, you know you're hearing from the Holy Spirit. I had a friend that this person said, this person came to me and they said that God wasn't, was telling them to not do something, very specific. God told them not to do something. And so I opened up the book of Matthew, and I showed them, well, God says right here that you're supposed to do that exact thing that you're telling me you don't want to do. And they said, well, the Holy Spirit told me to not do that. And, and the only response, unfortunately, was that I don't know what spirit you're listening to or who's telling you that, but it's not the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit will never tell you, will never contradict the word of God. It goes on to say that we'll be given strength and power. When the Holy Spirit fills us, we'll be given strength and power. See, the same Holy Spirit that gave Jesus the power to raise from the grave lives within us. Scripture says that he'll pour all his spirit onto all flesh, men and women. That's you and me. 
now, today. We'll be given strength and power to bring peace wherever Jesus calls us to go, to heal the sick, to drive out demons, to share the gospel. We'll be given strength. It says we'll be given strength to endure, to keep doing the work. See, our flesh may wear down, but through the Holy Spirit, we'll be given endurance to keep going. When we encounter that opposition that comes up against us, we'll be able to keep going. When we encounter that persecution, we'll be, get, we'll be able to keep going. The Holy Spirit will keep us going. It won't be our own strength. See, we, we can't get filled up once and then just keep going on and on, working for the Lord. Our flesh will fail. We have to keep going back to the word. We have to keep going back to prayer. We have to keep going back to devotion, spending time with God, spending time in God's presence so that we may be filled up to keep enduring. When the persecution comes, we'll be able to endure it, as that's the root word of endurance. We'll be, we'll be able to take it, endure for the Lord, giving him glory. We'll be able to keep going and doing the work that he's called us to do. See, we've been, this, this message has been about painting a picture. So the picture was, was titled Axios, right? That's the title of the painting. And what the picture is, is living life worthy of the gospel. So we talked about living a spirit-led life, a spirit-filled life, knowing the word of God. That's what the picture is. And we, we got the details of the fruit and the power and standing firm in the spirit. But now we're going to frame it and it will be ready to go. So, Because the last thing you're going to do on a picture is frame it. And this is what the frame is. Matthew 28, 19 says this, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. See, we want to live a spirit-filled, spirit-led life. We want to live a life worthy of the gospel. How do we live a life worthy of the gospel? Let's look at exactly what the gospel told us to do. See, Jesus is the gospel. It's his story. Jesus is the word became flesh. And he tells us, here, he tells us, go and make disciples. And so I have a question for you today, church, is this. Who are you discipling? If we're, in count, if we're told and commanded to go make disciples, who are you discipling? And so with that question asked, there should be names, people, a person, a soul that comes into your mind. Pray to God, who, should, who shall I be discipling? Who should I disciple if you're not yet? You should know exactly who you're discipling and who, who exactly is discipling you. Because if I can be very real for a second, we're all called, all of us are called to make disciples. See, there's, there's something that will get in the way of us or try and justify us to not do that. It's, the, it's called the yeah, but I. And so if I ask you, who are you discipling? Your first thought is, yeah, but I. Then we're probably not making disciples. It can be many things. It could be, yeah, but I serve. Pastor Brandon, I'm at the church on Wednesday nights. I'm at the church on Sunday morning. I'm an usher. I've been an usher for years. I'm on the tech team. I'm on the worship team. I'm a greeter. You don't, know, you don't know exactly what and how much I've been doing. Yeah, but I serve. But Jesus called us to make disciples. See, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be okay with partial obedience. We may give to the church and we may serve at the church, but when it comes to making disciples, we're okay with the partial obedience when Jesus told us to make disciples. See, we may make disciples and give, but we don't serve. Scripture has called us to live a life, a full life worthy of the gospel. Your, your response may be, yeah, but I, I'm in a Bible study. I'm in, I'm in three Bible studies. 
yeah, but I have been in the same Bible study with the same people for five, ten years. Who are you discipling? See, some, some of us, some of you are ready. You're more than ready to make disciples. You've been in the same Bible study or multiple Bible studies instead of finding younger believers, and they're there. They're in our church. Being with the young adults and the youth, the younger people are here needing and ready for other people to disciple them, to, to show them the word of God, to help them understand it and understand how to live it. God doesn't just call us to be, he, he calls us to grow in knowledge. The spirit will lead us to knowledge, but also to disciple others. Are we just gaining knowledge for knowledge's sake? He's calling us, he's calling you to make disciples. And so to close is this. If you are ready, if you want to make disciples, if you think I've been trained up, I know I've been in Bible studies. I just don't know how. Or I want to make disciples, and I'm not totally sure how. I don't know who I should be discipling. That's a great place to be if in your heart you say, I want to make disciples, but I don't know how yet. That's a perfect place to be because this word of God says this, for God gave the church pastors to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, which means God has given to the church pastors to give to to equip the saints, to equip, to train you to go do the work, to go make disciples. So if you want to make disciples, reach out, talk to, come to the church, talk to any of the pastors here. On the website, you can find our emails. If you know, if you know somebody, if you want to reach out to the staff or just call the front office, they'll get you in contact with the right person. God has given to the church pastors to equip and train you to do the work. So if you're ready to do the work, if God is impressing it on your heart to make disciples, that's a great place to be. And it's the pastor's job to equip and train you to be successful in doing the work. Jesus trained up the disciples to go, train the, to go change the world. And they, and they did that. He's given Pastor Ryan and Sam and Cornelius, myself, to go to train you, to equip you to go make disciples. So if you can bow your head and close in prayer with us. God, thank you for the word you have given. Thank you for the conviction and the challenging, the challenge of the word. We pray that we would examine our life this morning, that we would examine our life and, and think about, have we been putting you first? Has our life reflected that you are worthy? Or have we been striving after our flesh and ourself and to satisfy ourselves? Lord God, convict our hearts. Show us new ways that we can make you worthy, that we can live a life worthy, Father God. I pray that you would fill us with your spirit, fill us again, that we would stand firm in your spirit on the word of God, that we would not stray from it no matter what the world says, no matter what winds the world may throw at us, throw at us no matter what doctrine the world tries to change believers thinking that we would stand firm on the word of God in your Holy Spirit and that we would live a spirit-led life worthy of the calling you've given us and that we would go make disciples as you've commanded us to do in Jesus name we pray amen